So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Back to Basics Move Semantics Part 2. Perhaps a slightly more interesting part um, because this is now going more into the details of Move Semantics. So for those who have not been here in the first part, my name is Klaus Siegelberger. I've been a C++ trainer since 2016. I'm also a senior software engineer at Siemens. And you might know one of my works. I'm the author of the Play C++ Math Library. Also, additionally, I am co-organizer, uh, one of the four organizers of the Munich C++ user group. Also, sometimes present at C++ conferences. We are now in part two. In this part, I will be dealing with forwarding references, meaning we will talk about perfect forwarding, pearls of perfect forwarding, and overloading with forwarding references, and I will also show a couple of common pitfalls that hopefully afterwards you will avoid. This part is going to be a little more interactive than the first part. Um, again, please, if you know the answer, because you are a very experienced C++ guy, allow the, the audience, the rest of the people, to think about this for, let's say, three seconds, yeah? and then you can um, give it away. This, um, I, I think this is just fair. This is okay. If you have a question in between, I believe we have enough time for that, Please go up to the mic. Now it's been moved forward. This sh the acoustic should be a little better now. Um, still, for the recording, this is perfect. Please use the mic. All right, this is the feeling that you still have from the first part. Yes, I have mastered move semantics. It's not that difficult. Why are people complaining? Why is this something that people argue um, is, is so difficult, one of the most difficult features? Well, I did not mention another feature. I'm now talking about forwarding references. These two fellas here, the red ones, T ref ref, and also this auto ref ref, this looks like R value references. To some extent, it perhaps it even feels like an R value reference if you look at it, but unfortunately, it's not. This is a special kind of reference. And immediately, this good feeling that you had before is gone. Oh my. What have they done? Okay, so um, let's first give me a, a chance to explain what forwarding references are, because they indeed are special. A forwarding reference represents an L value reference if you pass it an L value. And as a reminder, an L value is something with a name. And a forwarding reference represents an R value reference if you give it an R value. So, meaning it adapts. It is whatever you initialize it with. And an R value reference is, in fact, a forwarding reference if it involves type deduction. And this is exactly these two uh, things. So, either a function template or order. And if it appears in exactly this form. So, only if you encounter an, in quotation marks, R value reference in this form, then it happens to be the special kind of reference, an R value reference. Now let me show you why they are special, why they behave differently. Let's say that I indeed have a function template called foo, and foo takes a t ref ref argument. Well, remember, this is one of the forms I showed before. And just to prove that something happens, I have added some output. Now in the main function, I have a widget. This is an L value. It has a name. And I pass it to foo. It should not work. From all I've said so far, this should not compile because an L value should not bind to an R value reference. This would be bad. We would move from the L value. The L value can still be used. I have a name. This would be bad. But it does compile. And it prints. Um, so this is the signature. It does compile and it prints foo t ref ref. So I've called the function. Surprisingly. Now what happens? Why does this work? Well, in argument deduction, this t is, for an L value, deduced to be widget ref. I, can, I don't, unfortunately don't have time to go into details why this is now made a widget ref. There is a one hour talk by Scott Myers from 2014 that goes in a lot of detail about type deduction. But believe me, t is deduced to be widget ref. But there is another set of references. So I have widget ref space ref ref. 
the space actually makes it um, something different. You're actually not allowed to write this kind of code. You cannot make a reference to reference. This is illegal. But the, um, the compiler can, up, can come up with this during type deduction. Now I have two references, an L value reference and an R value reference. We must do something. And there's something called reference collapsing. If indeed during template argument deduction, I have a reference to a reference, then I simply remove one of them. And the rule is, as soon as I have one L value reference in this mix, the result is an L value reference. Only and exclusively if I have a ref 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 ref, in the end I have a ref ref. As yeah, so now you understand why there's so many dog jokes, but okay. Um, in this case, I end up with a single L value reference. That's the deduction rule, or the reference collapsing rule. And so finally, this is the function that we would have. A function, the full function that takes an L value because it's an L value reference. And so it compiles. I can pass W to the function, it's an L value, this fits perfectly. Ooh, I know, this is a little frightening. But what about R values? Let's pass an R value. Let's create a widget without a name. This is an R value. In this particular case, okay, again, it calls the function, it prints foo. So also this works. And it works because now this T is deduced to be simply widget. Okay, again, don't ask me about the details. Um, the result is widget ref ref. And this is exactly the kind of argument, that the parameter that I need to pass an R value widget. Widget ref ref, it fits perfectly. Oh my. I know what you're thinking right now. What the, okay, take a deep breath. Yeah, so perhaps this helps a little bit. <sighs> okay, relax your mind a little bit. Of course, there is a very, very good reason why they added this to C++. And now I have to some extent uh, blame Howard Hinnant. He came up with this, um, because there was a, indeed a problem that was totally unsolved in C++ um, 98 and 03, so prior C++ 11. And this problem is perfect forwarding. If you want to write a function that is merely forwarding its argument to some other function, then you have exactly this situation. So a good example is the C++14 make unique. Makes unique task is just to forward the arguments that you give to it to the constructor of a T. Uh, so uh, whatever T I have, I just want to forward the arguments. Now how do I do that? This interestingly was a problem totally unsolved prior to C++11 or pre-C++11 because there was not, not a good general solution. The first solution that we would have uh, is to pass by value. This works pretty often. It might not work for types that are not copyable though. This is a limitation. And of course this creates overhead. Now imagine that I want to pass a string, a vector, something big. I do not want to create an extra copy. This is not perfect forwarding. This would be for kind of a forwarding but not perfect forwarding. So, for instance, yeah, ints would be fine. Widgets, you saw this contained string, uh, unique pointer, this would be expensive. Um, we could pass by reference, non-const reference. That surprisingly works for const L values too, so arc could also have a const. Um, but this here, for instance, this would not work. I could not pass an R value because an R value does not bind to an L value reference to non-const. It should not. This was something that, from the, so even before the standard was forbidden, this also causes problems a lot. So this would not compile. It's not perfect forwarding either. A whole group of arguments would be um, impossible. And the third option I have is reference to const, of course, the usual default. This is actually not so bad, it works for a lot of things, but there is again one limitation. Let's say for instance that I have a, a class example that takes an int ref. 
And I want to create an example. So it has a construct that they take an int ref. And I want to create an example by means of make unique. I want to pass an int, an int ref. I cannot because I have already added a const in the function and I can go on, cannot get rid of it anymore. So also this would not compile. Meaning there was no perfect solution, no general solution. All the options I have have some limitation. We were basically bound to um, have special purpose solutions. This is exactly what forwarding reference is supposed to solve. And this is exactly where they get their name from. This allows you to pass anything. This, uh, uh, this accepts L values, this accepts R values, cons values, non-cons values, volatile, non-volatile, anything that you could possibly have. Perfect. This is the right kind of reference. This is, by the way, why Scott Myers initially called these universal reference. It is kind of universal. It accepts anything and it can be anything. Now there's just a small additional problem that you now have. And this is what you've seen before. This may be an R value. Okay, I can pass an L value to this function. But just because in this function it has a name, it becomes an L value again. And now, as an L value, if it forward it in this form, I basically remove the opportunity to move this into T. So it's again not perfect. This is a limitation. Using move at this point, of course, again would be a big mistake. If I pass an L value, I would unconditionally move. And this would, of course, destroy an L value that might still be used in the calling scope. Bad. So I need something different. Instead of a unconditional move, I need a conditional move. A move that only moves if it is indeed an R value. And this is what was introduced, okay, the animation. This was in, what was introduced by means of standard forward. The, let's say, little brother of standard move. Standard forward is a conditional move. And for that reason, it looks similar yet different to, um, to standard move. It does it as static cast also, but it directly casts to T ref ref. There's no remove reference, whatever. It looks a little simpler. I will, a little later, tell you about the, um, the implementation details of forward, how it works, etc. Um, for now, let's just say we use this forward. We use it a little different though than move. We additionally pass the type. The value arc does not help me. It's always an L value, but the type gives it away. If the type shows me this is an L value, I basically cast to an L value reference again. If the type shows me this is an R value, I cast to an R value reference. So stood forward is the conditional move that I need here. And now it's suddenly perfect. Whatever you pass to this function, it will perfectly, with exactly the right type, with exactly the same properties, forward it to the function. So in this case, the constructor of T. Perfect forwarding. Now, make unique is of course not quite complete. In, in real life, it has, um, it uses forwarding references. So now I can pass an arbitrary number of elements and all of them are forwarding references. Of course, this is the final uh, make unique, but it works exactly as before. I forward every single argument in exactly the same way. Perfect. Now let's take a short look at how standard forward works. It is not, um, something particularly difficult, but again, it is relying on reference collapsing. So, this is how we used it. We pass the type arcs. So this is the forward function again. Let's first of all assume that I pass an L value. If I pass a widget again, my toy example, um, and it, an L value widget, then the T would, as before, become a widget ref. Uh, exactly the same thing as before. In all the places where I had T, suddenly have a widget ref. And now the same rules as before apply. Widget ref 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 becomes, in these two uh, places, a widget ref. And this remove reference T of a widget ref will simply be resolved to widget. And so ultimately, this is the forward function that would be instantiated. Okay, I take a widget, an L value, and I cast to an L value reference. So if you pass in an L value, you get back an L value reference. However, if I pass it an R value, then just as before, 
we would deduce widget, just widget. So widget refref, perfect, I do not have to do reference collapsing here, and remove reference t would resolve to widget. So again, I get an L value widget, but I return in this case widget refref. I statically cast to widget refref. And so, if you pass an R value, you will get back an R value reference. You cast to the right type again. So it's not a big uh, mystery, it's not a lot of magic, it just uses the rules that we've seen before in a in very nice way. And so the mechanics of stood forward. By the way, going back to, so to the initial signature, this is how forward looks like. And yes, it is different to what move looks like. So I showed you move before, and now for the first time we can perfectly analyze move. Move indeed takes a forwarding reference. I didn't mention this before, part of the second part, but yes, this T ref ref here is uh, in fact a forwarding reference. This is why move just takes anything. Just give me an L value or an R value, cons or non cons, I don't care, I will cast it into a, an R value reference. All right. This sounds like a pretty good idea so far. Oh, forwarding references. We take anything. Oh, cool. Absolutely nice. This is exactly what I was looking for. Unfortunately, there's indeed a couple of perils that you should be at least aware of. And as an example, I now introduce a, a struct here to simplify things, person. A person has a constructor that takes a name by string. This is a reasonable choice probably, so I can name a person by string. But there's so many more kinds of strings. So we might consider string view, and of course these are string literals, Q string, and okay, so there's many kinds of strings. You might have the idea that to save a little work, you introduce another constructor that takes a forwarding reference. Any kind of string. This sounds pretty nice. All right, let's use this. Let's create a person. I decided to create a piano on my own. Everybody needs a piano. Which constructor is used to create my piano? Correct, the second one. You might think, oh, but this is a string. No, it's not a string. This is a C star string riddle of type char seven. Yeah, I can count, it's six characters, but there's also the null terminating character. Um, and this fits best to the reference, the T reference. Well, it could be anything. So it takes a reference to a char seven, and we're done. We do not have, at this point, to create a string first. But this is exactly what we wanted. Cool, not bad. Okay, I want a second person. What person do I create? I think Bjorn needs a herb. Yes, everybody needs a herb too. So, um, I create a herb and I create a string first. So, string name, herb, and I pass the string. Now, which constructor is used to create herb? Okay, I hear a couple of one. This is exactly what we expect. This is very natural. I have a string, it's of course. How sh why should it be different? Of course it goes to the first function, but no, it does not. It's called the second function. And slowly but steadily you feel, oh, oh, this is unexpected. This is probably something that you later have to think through again. So why does it call the second function? Well, it calls the second function just because the argument, the name is not const. This is the only difference here, the, the, the only detail that makes it call the second function. The second function is instantiated in exactly the same um, form I explained before as if to take a string ref. It's an L value string, reference collapsing, etc. string ref. Now, I have two functions after this template instantiation that I can choose, constructor one that takes a const string and this newly instantiated second function taking string ref, non-const. Which one is better? Oh yeah, the second one, just because it's not const. You can easily prove this, add a const to the name, it will call the first function. That was unexpected, pretty unexpected. But this is not even the worst thing. Okay, we now do something that 
we probably shouldn't do, but we do it nonetheless. If, if, if you don't tell, I, I, I'm perfectly fine with it. We are now cloning one of these two guys. And I decided to clone a Bjarne. Everybody needs two Bjarne, right? So I'm now creating Bjarne again as a copy. I pass P1 as the argument. Now what happens? What do you think? What do we expect? I actually hope that you're thinking, of course we do a copy. Everybody copies a Bjarne. And for that purpose, of course, we have a copy constructor. No, it does not call the copy constructor. Unfortunately, it calls constructor2 again. Why? Well, same argument. Bjarne is not const. Bjarne is a free man. And for that reason, again, the second function is just a tiny bit better. The second constructor would take a person ref. The copy constructor, on the other hand, takes a const person ref. Okay, I can all exactly, I can imagine what you're thinking right now. Oh, what the, okay, again, keep calm. This is, perhaps this helps, yeah. So, the problem is, of course, that we have to remember that this is indeed special. And the problem is primarily overloading on um, forwarding references. In order to give you an idea now, let's practice this a little bit. So now it becomes a little more inter interactive. On the right, I have a function g that does a couple of things. Now in this example, it creates a widget w and um, passes this w to f. And believe it or not, I have six f functions, one, two, three, four, five, six. All of them can perfectly live in harmony because all of them just take references, but all possible kinds of references. Function one takes a non-const L-value reference. So reference, L-value reference to non-const. Function two takes an L-value reference to const. Function three takes an R-value reference. Function four takes, although this is probably not something that you've seen in the wild, an R-value reference to const. Function five takes a forwarding reference, hopefully you see this by now, and function six takes a const t ref ref, which makes it a, an R value reference again. So this is not a forwarding reference, this is just a, yeah, an R value reference to const again. So given the code on the right, I have an L value, it has a name, and I pass it to F. Which of these six functions is chosen as the primary choice? In other words, what is the best match? Okay, I hear a couple of answers and see a couple of answers. This calls function one. Some people expected function five. Well, actually, this is really, really close. Function five is considered, of course, as well. It is instantiated, and the compiler comes up with a signature so function five becomes f of widget ref, exactly the same signature as function one. Can also happen during template instantiation. Now we have two functions that take a widget ref. Luckily there's a rule in C++ that says if a template is instantiated and becomes exactly the same signature as a non-template function, the non-template is preferred. And for that reason, function one is the better match, although strictly speaking, both are equally well matched. Now let's assume that function one does not exist. What would be the second choice? This, so ignoring function one would be the, what would be the best choice of the remaining five? Correct, function five, because it is the same signature and now that the five function one doesn't exist anymore, this is the best match. There's a third possibility, the third best choice. Which of these functions is also an option but was not chosen yet because of the other two. Correct, function two. An R value, sorry, an, sorry. an L value can of course be passed to an L value reference to const, this works. The other three functions are not an option at all, an, R, an L value does not bind to an R value reference, this would be bad. Then something would be moved and again I would have a pretty big problem. This is the only choices. 
All right, let's make the code on the right hand side create a cons widget, a cons L value, and let's again think which function is called. So it's the same functions on the left. All right, I see a couple of two and you are correct. Function two is now again the best match, but again, there is one function that is a very, very tough competitor and it only loses because it's a template, that is function five. Function five is again the second best match. <laughs> so try it, it is indeed function five. Why not six? So function six is not an option because it takes an R value reference. It is an R value reference. I can pass an cons L value to a forwarding reference, but I cannot pass an L value in any state, cons and uncons, to an R value reference. Never works. This is why function six is indeed not an option. Perhaps to some extent this proves this is an R value reference. This is the only choices I have in this case. Function one is not an option because of the const. I can remove const and the others are again R value references. The fun continues. Now I have R values on the right hand side. So a function that creates R values. Assuming that I call F with an R value, which function would be the best match? Okay, I should be specific, a non-const R value of course. Okay, You're starting to pick up a pattern here. This is not bad, function three. Function three is the best choice because it's again a perfect match. However, yet again, function five is a very tough competitor. The compiler will come up with a signature widget ref ref. It is only losing again because it's a template. If function three does not exist, this function would be called yet again. And you start to get the feeling. If there is, if there's no other function that it's a, a perfect match, a so-called identity match, then this tiny little black hole called forwarding reference takes it all. Now in this case, I have a third choice. What would be, assuming that these two do not exist, what would be the third choice? Function four is correct. I have an R value, an R value wants to bind to an R value reference, and so this function is a little better. Function six is a template. And so again, function four is preferred, and function six would in this situation be the second choice. But if you thought two, correct. It is a choice, but however, this is the fallback. This is the fallback that has, ever, has always existed. Since the very beginning, R values bind to L value reference to const. So if you do not use R value references at all, so if function three to six do not exist, then function two is the the common fallback. This, by the way, is also the reason why if you don't use move, um, it still works. Uh, if you have an R value, it would simply call the copy constructor of something. Um, it would create a copy. Okay, there's of course one, um, uh, one possibility left. I do not think that you see this a lot in, in, in the wild. I now create a const R value. Which function is now the best match? Yeah, I know what you think, but I, I like to play it till the end, okay? Function four, perfect. So if you thought about this right away, I think you, you got it. What would be the second choice? Okay, actually you're correct, it's six. Okay, you avoided my trap. This is the first case and the only case where it does not uh, call five. This time function six is a little bit better because of the const. This takes const R value references. The fi function five, however, would indeed match exactly the signature function six, but because the other one is const, meaning a little more special, function six is called, and function five is only the third choice. And also here I can choose function two as the final fourth choice. Function one and function Function one is not an option because um, it's an L value reference and function three is an R value reference, of course, but it has an L const. All right, now I think you got it. 
Still, it is a pretty complicated. So overloading with forwarding references is something that is probably best avoided. Make unique a single function that is somewhere, this is where it is working best. So personal uh, my personal advice, if you indeed want to solve this forwarding, this perfect forwarding problem, use forwarding references because there's nothing better. This is exactly what it does well. Do not just use it randomly. So if you use a forwarding reference, then use it for a specific reason. Yeah, know what you're doing. And I basically just give you the advice that Scott Myers gave in his Effective Modern C++ book, item 26, avoid overloading on universal references. So as I said before, Scott called them universal reference, meaning forwarding reference. Of course, if you know what you're doing, you're fine. For the back to basics track, this is the general advice that I would give you. Now there is indeed a couple of pitfalls. Basically, we have now covered the technical part. But still, although we now know about the technical details, we might stumble across a couple of yeah, pitfalls. Things that go wrong because we do not pay attention. Things that go wrong perhaps because people do not completely understand the details. And well, I now designed this in a special way. Yeah, so you now invited to participate in a new episode of who wants to become an R-value reference expert? And involuntarily, you are the participants of this game show. You now have to participate by thinking about the following problems. Problem number one. I now have a, okay, simplified class A. Class A takes a T ref ref, and you see it is a templated constructor. And I move my argument little t into my data member b. Now the question is of course not does um, b wants to have the t, no, no. The question that I basically have is, is this semantically correct? Do I use the features that I just described in a correct way or not? So entry question, you have 15 seconds to think about it. All right, hopefully you all saw this. This was kind of the entry level question and I heard the answer already. I said three seconds, yeah, not one uh, or two. Uh, so it doesn't matter. You should use not move. This is basically, basically a big, big error. This is what kind of reference, this T ref ref? A forwarding or universal reference. I should not move unconditionally. It could be an L value and this is um, causing trouble at the call site. I should indeed use a forward in exactly this form. Now it's perfect. Okay, hopefully this is something that never happens to you, but this would indeed be a serious bug. Okay, perhaps this was too simple. Let's use this one, uh, uh, let's take a look at this one, example two. Now I have a class template and it takes its, it has a constructor that takes its argument as a t ref ref again. I now forward my little t into my data member b. Again, you have 15 seconds. All right. What is going wrong here? And I have to admit, this is indeed something I've seen a couple of times, okay, not a lot of times, a small number of times. It is. Okay, so you're correct. I have unfortunately anticipated that I'm using a forwarding reference here. T ref ref, what kind of reference is T ref ref? It is an R value reference indeed. This here is a class template parameter. Uh, okay, let's ignore this. So the comment was do deduction rules count? Okay, um, T ref ref is an R value reference only. In order to make this a forwarding reference, I need type deduction in the function of course. Um, it needs to be a, f uh, a fun uh, template uh, function, templated constructor. If it's only an R value reference and I forward 
It's not perfect. This is some, not something that breaks things. This is kind of harmless. You will notice that this is not a forwarding reference because you will not be able to pass any kind of L value. And since you only um, pass, can pass R values, then the forward would still do the right thing. It still is not really correct. This is probably not what you intended. The fix, so this is an R value reference, as I said. The fix would by, basically be to say, let's move. It's an R value reference, let's, it should be moved. But I doubt that this was the intention. Probably it has to be redesigned. Probably want to make this a templated constructor. I don't know. Okay. Please don't repeat this. Please take care that it's only a forwarding reference um, if it is using type deduction. All right. Example three. Now I have two data members. Call them B and C. I have one argument again, and now I again have a templated constructor. My argument, my little t, is forwarded into B, and my little t is forwarded into C. Again, 15 seconds. At least three. All right. A, a little louder, sorry. Okay, the second one can fail, you say. I know what you mean, so I, I would just want to uh, mean, uh, a little more precise. What should I not do? What is the real mistake? Okay, double move, correct. I am using forward twice. Forward is basically some kind of move. It's obvious that I should not move something twice. Once it's moved from, I cannot really move again. It apparently is not so obvious that I also should not use forward twice, because it's, well, the same thing. If I pass an R value, and if B happens to indeed move from this T, then C is left with a moved from object. This is, again, a pretty bad situation. This is something I have uh, luckily only seen in test code for whatever reason. But it indeed was hard to, uh, to make people understand that this is a move, although it's called forward. All right, so do not um, use forward twice, forward exactly once. Meaning I have to, well, first copy T. There's no other way. I pass T to B, B does, do, does uh, create a copy, when, whatever it needs, and then I can safely forward T into C. All right. Example four, I now have, again, two data members, but I have also have two arguments. The first argument is of type capital T1, and the second type of ty is of type capital D2. My little T1, my argument, is forwarded into data member B, and my little T2 is forwarded into C. Again, 15 seconds to think about this one. All right, what's wrong here? Okay, perhaps I have to ask differently. Who feels this is absolutely correct? Oh, quite a number of hands, meaning you actually feel this is okay. Have you, have you considered the distinct possibility that these two refer to the same object? But you're right, it is absolutely okay. So, it can refer to the same object. This is, of course, possible. It can be the same L value. So, for instance, I can call this constructor with two times T. So, uh, open in parentheses, T comma T. Okay, it's the same L value. L values are fine. They're not forwarded. Everything's okay. But how do I call this function with the same R value? Think about this. I have to do something pretty bad. I have to call this constructor with move t comma move t. This is of course a serious error on the call side. We just said we should ne never move twice. 
The basic idea of an R value reference is this is a unique reference. There is exactly one reference to this object, exactly one, and therefore you can safely forward here without having to think about potential aliasing. Perfectly okay. Yeah, okay, I know, I was messing with you. But still it was interesting. Example five, something that I also unfortunately sometimes see. Now I have a function create. Create gets a couple of arguments. These arguments are now perfectly forwarded into um, the make unique function. Yeah, probably there's something more happening here. That's a little short. You could use make unique directly. Make unique returns a unique pointer. And then just to be a little more efficient, we move the unique pointer from the function. What's wrong here? Okay, who spotted the problem? Okay, a little louder, I'm sorry. Perfect, perfect answer. You break copy elision. So this is not a bug in the sense of it does not work anymore. This is a bug in the sense you actually pessimize your code, if this is a word. It was, I'm sorry? Not guaranteed, that is true, but okay. Um, very likely, this function would actually return this very efficiently by means of something called return value optimization, also called copy elision. That is, by the way, the best thing a compiler can do for you. If you return something from function in a return statement, then this very likely will end up in the return value optimization. Most specifically, in this case, the named return value optimization because uPointer has a name. However, as soon as you try to move something from the function, this return optimization is simply turned off. Yes, this will be moved from function, great. But the move is indeed a pointer operation, whereas RVO is kind of a no-opt. You have no cost at all. So this is kind of an anti-pattern. Do not move objects from a function. It does not give you anything. It does not improve anything. Do not move, just uh, properly return. And since I basically don't do anything here in this small example, I could simply return directly. If this is possible, do so. This is now returning an R value. You do not give it a name. And this gives you additional properties. For instance, in C17, this guarantees the return value optimization. And of course, this is much more valuable. So whenever you have the opportunity to not name anything, do not name it. Now, this is kind of a general rule. Could you use a mic? That would be great. Yeah, so this is something that I've worried about. So how do you know when you're gonna get RVO or not get RVO? Because if that's a huge object and you don't get that RVO, it's a All huge right. cost. Okay, this is what, what I try to evade also in the rest of the talk, so I mentioned it. And of course, the, the, uh, the Pandora's box has been opened. Um, so the return validation is a pretty complex topic in itself. There's no guarantee that you get, so in this case, I'm sorry, in this case, you get the guarantee. This is a Z plus plus 17 guarantee, but um, in a general case, you don't know. However, there is a, something that you can rely on. If the compiler cannot use RVO, and that's the very first thing it tries, then it falls back to move. And so I don't have to do it explicitly. So if RVO is not triggered, at least I get a move for free. And if move does not happen, the last thing the compiler tries is a copy. And if this doesn't work, then of course the code is, um, doesn't work, you get a compilation error. All right, I have one more. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, in C17, if I happen to actually name that return value, is there any way to uh, force RVO nevertheless? So is there a way to force RVO? Um, as I said, in C17, there is the guarantee. In the standard, it says this example here will return it. Surprisingly, even if it does not have a move constructor and not a copy constructor. In this example, it will be RVO'd. Now, I can return something that cannot move, that cannot copy from a function. Um, else, you cannot force it. It's a compile optimization. 
at least I'm not aware of any kind of to force it. However, this is a, an optimization that exists in C++ 98. And over the years, it has improved. Uh, C++ 11 gave you a little more guarantees. In C++ 11, this became a mandatory optimization. And I think compilers are pretty clever nowadays. There is no way you can force it, but you can rely on it pretty, pretty well. Okay. Does, does it affect if you use different compilation flags like 0201 release debug to enforce using uh, return value optimization? Interestingly, no. Um, RVO is something that compiler might do right away. And this, for instance, well, there's a guarantee. Even if you compile with debug mode 0, this will return it so it's not switched off. So this return value optimization is kind of independent of the optimization level that you choose. Okay. okay. One last one, I hope. It um, feels a little bit like you don't want to see the six example. But okay, <laughs> go on. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? To which example? To the previous uh, slide. Just the previous, yeah. this one. So here, uh, UPTR, it's a local variable. We are returning a reference. Uh, don't we okay. have an issue? There's again a lot of echo. Okay. Move away a little bit from the mic and perhaps okay. speak louder. That This is, makes it easier so, for me. UPTR, it's a local variable. Okay. If we uh, return a CD move, it's a valid code, but we are returning uh, a reference to a local variable. Okay, I do not return a reference in this case. I do return by value. Oh, okay. I mean yeah. But perhaps um, your question is pointing, uh, is going in the direction I wanted to show anyway. Do not please return by reference. Even, so, not L value reference and also not R value reference. Yeah, this does not help at all. You would return a reference to local object. The reference would be invalid when it is returned. The object is already destroyed. This is, of course, also a, um, an anti-pattern. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <coughs> I just have one uh, comment to make. There, so there's two flavors of uh, return value, right? There's named Correct. return value. Correct. There's return value. Correct. And the easy way to check what's going on is just to do it <coughs> with a simple class, right? You can step in a debugger or you can just put some print statements. And what I've found where I am is the older Solaris compilers don't do NRVO. So if you okay. name it and return it, you don't get it, but the Linux compilers will do that. All right. Okay. Thanks so for the always, comment. So always measure. Yep. All right. Thanks for the comment. All right. Example six. Okay. My animation return returns reference to local object. Of course, there is a core guideline. Don't return a trefref. Apparently, this is so common that there is even a core guideline. Um, so, please don't do it. So, okay. Why is it valid? Why do they let you do it? Okay, you ha you are in charge in C++. You are the one who who decides what is happening. So perhaps that's the reason. Okay. Example six, I now have a foo function that takes again a forwarding reference. Now we see it for what it is. The type that I get could be integral, but it could be also something else. I would like to, dis, uh, to deal with integral types differently. So there is an if cons expert. I use the type that is integral. If it is indeed integral, I fall into this if branch and else I deal with this as a non-integer. Something wrong here, I promise. 15 seconds. All right, this is indeed tricky. I have to admit, I spent two hours of my life debugging this particular problem. So I felt like sharing is not a bad idea. What is happening here? So, Fedor says um, it's about the T. Is integral T? Unfortunately, T is not necessarily a concrete type. Type deduction in case of an L value would make the T a, for instance, widget ref. And a widget ref is never an integral. Um, and so, even if you pass an L value integer, uh, yeah, int, 
then this would be an interref and this would also not be an integral. So in other words, um, is integral might fail although it's an integral type. And so this does not exactly do what I intended to do. What you have to do here, what you cannot, for, sh should not forget is, okay, animation again, you should explicitly remove the reference. It could be a reference based type, the T itself. If you use the no ref type, everything works as expected. This is a little tricky, but this is just part of this deduction rules. This is part of the magic of forwarding references. Um, this is why a little more difficult to use. Okay, use the mic, please. Should we also remove const as well here? If the T should you, oh, if the, you should the remove the const expert? Const, const integer. Uh, okay, the const is, by the way, not a problem. A const int is recognized as an int, or as an integral. The const is not a problem, but the ref is. So, I, okay, if you want to, you can also remove the, the const, but this is what you have to do. All right. We are back here. Yes, it was a tough piece of work, I admit. It is not one of the easiest features, but still you managed within two hours to basically see the, the technical details. I believe on your road into more the details, um, you will have now a much, much smoother path. So now, believe it or not, this could be you. This is you, the new R-Value reference expert. So thank you very much. <laughs> is there any more questions? Yeah, please, please use the mic. Okay, questions about the stack frame. Uh, I don't really understand, I don't know if it's in the scope of this presentation, to let me to understand how would a stack frame look like if I would you call a function that is, uh, that okay. takes. Okay, now the acoustics is again bad because. If I call the function that uh, takes the argument as a, as a refref, which is itself calling the target function. Because since it's refref, I would understand that modifying that uh, object would uh, land modification in the deeper in the stack, am I correct? Okay, do you mean I can call, if, what happens if I call myself, kind of? No. No, 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 simply. It's the acoustics, I'm sorry. Okay. It, <laughs> uh, if I want to avoid moving the object, it means that the automatic variable still resides in a stack frame of my parent, right? Yes, correct. Which means that uh, my automatic, uh, let's say, this ref ref, uh, if I modify this ref ref, uh, or not modify, simply call this ref ref uh, value, I cannot modify it, it means I'm calling the something that is up in the stack. Correct. So, yes, it's still on the stack. The object that you move from is on the stack still. It lives on until it is finally destroyed. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and second very simple question. Uh, I, I can have an int i, for instance, an integer. I, have, I can have a reference for that integer. Um, the i has a name. This would yes. be an L value. Yeah. It would not pass to a ref, ref function. Yes. No, I mean, simply forget about the function. Simple, okay. uh, in the function body, I can have a int i is, I don't know, free. Then I have int reference j, it's i. It means that the i would be the reference, reference of j. Now, I understand it wouldn't make sense to make a ref ref to the i somehow, right? But I okay. never, never tried it. I think this is hard to explain, especially since you're trying to point out different things. So let's take this offline. I'm happy to answer the question. Perhaps you can show me a piece of code right if you mind. Other questions? No? All right. Then, thank you very much. <laughs>